Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you for having me, first of all. So my first question for you is a rhetorical question. If you've ever studied a language, or you studied a region, or something in a comparative context, or even a skill applied globally, how much better would that education have been if you could interact with the people of the relevant country in a sustained manner and an effective manner? We think the answer is a lot better, uh, and so that's what we that's what we dedicate ourselves to. Um, we're basically starting a new organization, which is called Tularen. It contributes to healthier global affairs by working with institutional partners to make knowledge trade. And knowledge trade, I think, is our buzzword uh, between driven students anywhere, easy and effective. Now, what does that mean? We had our first pilot last semester in fall. Uh, we actually had two case studies. And what we did was we tried to have knowledge trade happen in the medium of the dual country classroom. Two countries uh, meeting together and having knowledge trade happen. Um, we started with the hardest case first so we can prove that this could work anywhere. This is Iraq. Uh, this is the American University of Iraq in Soleimani. And in the top, you see Yale students. Our first case course was called Reconstructing Law After Political Shock. When you have a major political transition, how are legal institutions reconstructed? We had three case studies, South Africa, uh, Iraq, and Egypt. Um, we, uh, and basically the, basically the way we taught it was first we would record lectures, like a MOOC, a massive online open education course. Um, here's Professor Ian Shapiro at Yale talking about South Africa. Here's a professor in George W. talking about Egypt. Uh, we record the lectures, we put them online, the students watch them. Um, uh, some professors who haven't uh, had training in, in uh, giving a mono lecture, or e even if they had training, we decided that the interview format was actually much more interesting, to have the interaction kind of be captured on screen rather than have a, have a monologue. So we, we prefer the interview format. We record it, we put it online. The students in Egypt watch it, the students in Iraq watched it, the students at Yale watched it. And then we have them enter into a class, like this one in Iraq, or this one in Egypt. And then the students discuss the topic. Now, they've already had the lecture from the professor. They've already done the readings. The point of the discussion is for them to get knowledge they could not have gotten in a mono-country classroom, the classroom we, we, we have right now. Um, and I think an example of that type of knowledge trade uh, is, is, uh, is really well represented uh, in, in Hadil's contribution and then some of the back and forth they had with Yale. So this is the American U uh, University of Cairo. Hadil happens to also work in the Egyptian Department of Economic Progress. She's the one that uh, deals with what happens to American aid when it goes to Egypt. Uh, she knows what happens to it. And so we learned that and uh, we had a section on our Egypt case study uh, on the question, uh, what is the impact of American aid on Egyptian legal development or, Amer or Egyptian legal institutions? And, uh, and, and we had relevant readings on it. We had some of the lecture focus on that. But the, but the star of that conversation was obviously the information Hadil brought. And then the Yale students had a, you know, had a fascinating back and forth. What are the American ethics of giving aid, taking back aid? What are the political implications? And, uh, and it was a fascinating discussion. In contrast, the Egyptian students were very much interested in American federalism and how in America, when we graduated into the West, we had to be territories first. And when the government was developed enough, you had states. Um, this was relevant for Egyptians because they were wondering how do we get the Sinai under control? Uh, and does federalism work? And, and so we had some fascinating discussions um, I mean, in Iraq, we had uh, conversations about the American perspective on the Iraq invasion, the Iraqi perspective on the Iraq invasion. Um, uh, these students are in the Kurdish region, so how does Kurdistan work with Iraq? And, and sometimes, we, sometimes we learn by example. Uh, there, there was a time in Egypt where the students couldn't come to class because of protests, so we had them uh, Skype in from their homes. And uh, when the American government shut down, we had a, we had a joint uh, commiseration session about how, what happens when your government shuts down. Uh, and and, and we, we learned a lot about uh, comparative government shutdown. Uh, it was fascinating. Um, now, we find that the knowledge, knowledge trade works specifically in three different types of courses. One of them is the comparative course, where you're trying to compare something. Uh, we're working with a professor at Yale to try to do a course next semester in fall on comparative perspectives in genocide, where we bring in the University of Rwanda, uh, and maybe the University of, Sar I'm sorry, the University of Sarajevo, and if we can get a hold of them, the University of Rwanda. Um, and you know, there's many, many more possibilities for that. The second thing, which we haven't experimented with yet, uh, but we do, and I'd like to thank um, Anelika, because I am also a, a lover of languages, uh, uh, but we, we want to start doing language courses where we have the knowledge trade happen as knowledge for language. So something we envision is that a group of advanced American Arabic learners, for example, or whatever language, Spanish, uh, Chinese, who uh, uh, can take a course with native Arab speakers 
and the Arab speakers will be tasked with helping the advanced speakers with Arabic, whereas the topic of the course will be something that the American students already know very well, like American history, and then the Arabic students get, 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 you know, get that knowledge uh, in return. And the reason we like knowledge trade is because this is, this is what makes it sustainable. If both countries benefit, you can do it because you both have a value added. If it's more like an aid thing where you're giving knowledge, it doesn't really last. It falls apart because only one person's benefiting. Um, uh, the third way that this works is practical skills globally applied. Our pilot for this semester, which is starting on Wednesday, because the Iraqi academic calendar is a bit different, uh, is uh, overcoming governance obstacles with technology. How do you use technology to overcome population management problems? And so we're looking at refugee camps, and hopefully we'll get students in Iraq who've dealt with refugee camps. And we, uh, we have a, uh, it looks like it'll be a really cool course, uh, is one example. Another example is uh, we've been asked by a Syrian NGO to work with American, uh, American engineering universities to provide the knowledge of engineering um, to Syrian engineering instructors. And in return, they'll be able to do research there or they'll be able to bring, uh, give us perspectives on how do you rebuild a country, uh, a country's infrastructure after war. And so if you're an American and you want to work at the UN or you want to work in international crisis group, this is prime training. And if you're a Syrian and you want to rebuild your country and you want to learn engineering, this is obviously a great way to do it because it's hard to find teachers now in Syria. So, um, this, so these are the three ways that we think the dual country classroom and knowledge trade can work. Um, here's some feedback from students from our first semester. The first semester, we were called Global Teaching, uh, teaching Fellows. Here I, here I give a thank you to Sarah Ronis for representing the interests of graduate students. I, I happen to be on the Graduate Student Assembly on the Academic and Professional Development Committee. Um, and so one of my concerns originally was also to make sure that graduate students um, had a role in this. And so we have teaching fellows as well. Um, so it used to be called Global Teaching Fellows, but then everybody told me that the name was really cheesy. So we changed it to Tularen, uh, which I can explain later. Uh, but, 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 but these are some, uh, these are some feedbacks. Um, I just think some, uh, some of the points here are that um, this does not replace study abroad, but it's an extension of study abroad. If you study abroad and you come back to America, you can continue your interaction. If you never had the money to study abroad, this is also really good. Um, and it's a way for you to do study abroad as a group, uh, kind of. And you can do it sustainably, and it's very cheap. The, the first two pilots cost $90. Um, so, so it's really cheap to do. Um, here's, here's feedback from one of the Egyptian students, and here's feedback from one of the Yale students. Um, I don't want to talk too much more. I want to open it for questions, so I can send people this if they're interested. We, we have a lot more. Uh, we have many more things like this, and testimonials and stuff. Um, so what our goal is now is we want to become a 501c3, and we want, we want to grow this. We want to help universities be enabled to do the dual country classroom. We think of it like the cell phone. If you have one cell phone, it's useless. If, there's, if I have a cell phone and Eric has a cell phone, it becomes a little bit more useful. Um, if I have a cell phone and you all have a cell phone, it becomes very useful. And if I have a cell phone and the whole world has a cell phone, the cell phone is very, very, very useful. Our goal is to um, do what we call regional gradualism, work in regions, starting with the easiest universities, then using our alumni to spread into more uh, difficult places. So for example, I'm, I'll be going to the Middle East in March, and I'll be using, uh, I'll be converse, uh, conversing with some of the alumni from the American University of Cairo, and discussing how do we get them to also get involved with maybe the University of Cairo and other developing Egyptian universities, um, in, uh, in having those partnerships be very useful. Um, similarly, the same thing in Iraq. I actually just met with somebody from the University of Baghdad today, uh, and we'll be working with how to, we'll figure out how to get that to work out given our previous experience in Baghdad. But we want to get more cell phones out there. We want to get uh, universities to be dual country classroom compatible so that no matter where you are in the world, you can have a partnership with somebody else. And it's good for America, it's good for American students, it's good for European students, it's good for uh, students in developing countries. And they mutually benefit and you get horizontal relationships. It's not a top down uh, zapping our knowledge to them. Uh, we're both trading. And, um, um, you know, we want people to get involved. Um, I, I hardly ever bump shoulders with anybody in the street now, except for that they get you know a good two minutes from me <laughs> about this. But we're, we, uh, we're, we're recruiting a board of trustees. We have two down, one more to go. And we're saving that spot for a Yaley. We want somebody from Yale. This grew in Yale. We want somebody from Yale. Uh, uh, you know, some, uh, so we're looking for that person. We're looking for institutional partners. We want to work with everybody here. Uh, we're looking for professorial focus groups. We often just uh, meet with a professor. And we just say, hey, like, here's your idea. What do you want to do? How, you know, what, what, if you could do a dual country classroom in any country, if you could trade knowledge with anybody, how would you do it? And we just talk with them and we, we work things out. And we also want to recruit one full-time person in the summer. Right now our team is uh, basically two full-timers. On the side, we get our degree here at Yale, but yeah, <laughs> this, takes, this takes a lot of time. We, we have four, four kind of part-time helpers here at Yale. And then we have a team in Egypt and a team in Iraq. 
and we're trying to get a team going in Bosnia um, for, for one of the classes. And, um, uh, and here's our contact information. information. Mine is, I'm Saad, Saad, S-A-A-D, dot Ansari, A-N-S-A-R-I at yale.edu, Eric Tilburg, E-R-I-C dot T-I-L-L-B-E-R-G at yale.edu. We're open to questions, and we especially love critiques. Whenever we get a new staff member, I, I have the old team critique me, uh, and like, uh, uh, just like really rip my ideas apart, because we grow from critique, and we grow from criticism. It's the best thing in the world. Uh, uh, you know, one of the best things, I guess, after Yale. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, that's welcome from anybody. And uh, if anybody wants a brochure, we have brochures too. Thank you. Questions? Uh, our, our vision is that refugee camps can become like Yale University. If you're in a refugee camp, you should be able to get a Yale, uh, Yale University education. Questions? Well, I ha have a question. Um, who's sponsoring this, or who's helping you with this? Uh, we, ha we have these other sort of things that underpin things here at Yale. Uh, do you have a, a faculty sponsor up there uh, to, to uh, oversee this, mm -hmm. or to, to um, bounce things off of from time to time? Or is this an initiative entirely student-driven? So, so uh, it was definitely student initiated. Um, uh, we have a number of professors for whom we're developing courses. So, for example, the uh, Rwandan, sorry, the, the, the Perspectives in Genocide course is a Yale professor. We're working with a senior fellow to get a course going for next semester. Um, and I, I'm going to be asking, um, uh, I'm going to be asking another Yale professor to get more involved soon. Um, it's really a collection of people. Um, and in terms of other sponsors, we're, we're developing a board of trustees. So one of them is in New York, another one is in D.C. Um, but we're building a pool of, of people to help us out. Mm -hmm. Bill, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks. Um, not to get too technical, but nonetheless, um, this concept is intriguing that it cost $90 to do uh, yeah. a, a, a class like. So can you talk just a little bit of, of you know, what the technology was oh, yeah, essentially and how does one do this for $90? Sure. So, so obviously, that's everybody working pro bono because we're all, we're all pilots. You, you mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, for, even for this first summer program, you had guinea pigs. For, uh, I think they're like guinea heroes. Like they, they go through like a lot of, a lot of development and they do, it, yeah, they do it pro bono. But, um, but the simplest version is we use uh, just, uh, 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 just, just, like the, just like the language program, we use, um, uh, we use the Cisco web conferencing. We do try Google Hangout and Skype because we actually do have an intention to work with refugee camps uh, eventually. Uh, good, because st students in refugee camps, if you do the application process, they can be brilliant, um, we and we don't want them to, to not have any opportunity. Um, so we Cisco is expensive to use, and Yale happens to have it. But other options like Google Hangout is very cheap. As a matter of fact, we consult with Google uh, Google Ideas from time to time, and we uh, we figure out um, how, how to how to make it better for our purposes. Um, we are, we're in discussion with a MOOC platform that previously exists to see how we can readapt that to make it better fit for the dual country classroom. Um, for resource share sharing, um, we'll be using Canvas. Uh, we want to develop some technologies that don't exist yet. For example, a bilingual chat box. It's not our goal now, but it's our goal in two years to be able to have a dual country classroom where the students speak different languages. It'll take some pedagogical innovation and it'll take some technological innovation. So we want to develop a bilingual chat box, um, but that's two years down the road. Um, um, and other than that, we're, we're always experimenting. The iPad idea sounds great, so we'll, we'll probably experiment with that sometime. Um, um, yeah, we're always experimenting. Other questions? Critiques are also welcome. Mm -hmm. Well, once again, we, we learned that there are individuals here at this institution doing wonderful, exciting things, and, and we can learn from uh, from uh, this particular project, the project of Assad and, and, and Eric, and, and uh, more power to you. Um, um, I guess, um, how can we see this in action? Is it possible for our committee to to come in and sit in on a class oh, yeah. at some point? Is so so, uh, so we're beginning your new semester on the Iraqi calendar on Wednesday, uh, Overcoming Governance Obstacles to Technology. So if you want to sit in, just send, send me or Eric an email, um, and, and we'll have you come. Uh, everybody's welcome. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much.